So, and we also managed to identify if they were combined or overlapped one of another, one on another. Once we have a feature, what do we do with it? Because we have numbers, we have some numbers, we have a vector, we have some you know, space domain representation. But what does it mean? That's what we are after, not a number. You need to classify. No way out. Oh. You need to make a decision, and this decision is a classification. Um, you can have classification in multiple ways. Homogeneous, meaning that you have a bunch of you know, frequencies from the uh, Cycle, cycle stationary autocorrelation function, and it's an homogeneous feature space, no problem. Or you can have the energy, you can have the autocorrelation, plus you can have some, something else. I can't even imagine. And that's a uh, heterogeneous feature space. This is a bit more difficult to handle because it's very di more difficult to understand what's going on in, in that specific domain representation of, of the signal. Nevertheless, both of the cases can be treated in the same way in decision. Sometimes, as I was saying, the, a feature that you put into a decision process is a decision made by someone else or some other process. That's up to you. Again, up to your application, up to your needs, up to your goal. We can have three types of decision. Distributed, I take what I have, I decide. Cooperative, I take what I have. Give an example of someone who's looking at me. You take what you have. Either we decide and we share our decisions, or we share the information and then we make a decision together. Or centralized. You guys, you guys give me what you have, and I decide. These are the three main classifications that we have. I will, we will have a look about all of them. Distributed decision. The simplest classification process is the Bayesian one. Maximum a posteriori, a posteriori probability classifier. As the oldest one, again, we go back to the end of the 60s with this beautiful book, which is still used in didactics, which is the Van Trees, where basically, if we have two hypotheses of a phenomenon, for example, there is or there is not a spectrum all, that could be an example, I compute my likelihood ratio or likelihood function by taking the posteriori probabilities of these two phenomena given the received signal R and then I compare respect to this ratio of the priors of the phenomenon. This is the most simple, you can extend it into billions of different ways, you can combine it. And it was developed for radar target detection. So you receive a signal and you decide if there is an incoming enemy or not. That was the main goal. <coughs> and as a matter of fact, when we are talking about classification, we always have uh, um, error probability, and the error probability is made out by probability of non-detection, so you don't detect the ob object, or probability of misclassification. So you, you even, even if the object is present, you don't, sorry, even if uh, there is the object, sorry, confused. It's probably it's false alarm. Sorry? False alarm is the term that is Probability of false, false alarm. alarm. Yes, yes, thanks. 
uh, false alarm exactly because of the fact that there is, yes, false alarm and missed alarm, yes. Missed alarm is that when uh, you have an enemy and it strikes, oops, uh, or when you, are, when you don't have an enemy but the radar sees it. And you say, eh, let's just check, let's, let's send a couple of F-13 on the fly. Uh, and that's it. Simple, easy to use, everyone does it, student grade. Or we can go in some more complex theory. And there is an assumption. And the assumption is that just the presence of other detectors in the environment would change how I classify. <coughs> Without sharing no information, we share no information, we are completely disconnected, but just because there is someone else, my process changes. There is a very nice demonstration of it in Varshni, 1996. Uh, and this is the parallel decision networks distributed detection without fusion. So as you can see, we have the traditional likelihood ratio function, but the the threshold here is computed as a function of the decision of the other classifier, which is U2. Because the, fa the problem is that the other classifier observes another version of the same phenomenon. Just imagine we decide to classify if there is or not uh, a channel occupied in the, in the spectrum but I observe it from one place, you, you guys observe from another one. So these two representations can improve the classification simply if I take into account that there is someone else. Of course, there is no closed formula of resolution. It's, you, you need to solve the problem uh, via um, <coughs> Uh, simulation of the thresholds and uh, in, uh, crossing of the two functions of the first detector and the second one. Nevertheless, it's there, it's not widely used. I used it, but it's not common. More common is if we cooperate. If you decide to cooperate, just be aware of one thing that you know one could think if I increase the amount of information I have available for the for decision then I decide better it is what everyone thinks unfortunately it's false it has been proved mathematically if you take a Bayesian classifier you change the amount of features available for classification, meaning the accuracy of the representation of the space you have, and you see this effect. And this effect gives you an increase of um, correct decision probability after, up to a certain extent, you put one feature more and you go down. This is done for in different situations, also very theoretical one with infinite precision and, uh, and so on. So it's look just at the, the, at the trend. And the trend is that depending on your application, depending on your feature space, you increase your accuracy, increasing the number of features you pass to the classifier, up to a certain extent, it gets confused. And everything goes down dramatically. That's called a huge phenomenon. It's unfortunately not very well known outside the pattern recognition field. But then, how can we cooperate? So, We need to separate two ways. The first one is the technology we use to, to cooperate. And we can use, we need a, you know, 
message passing or protocol methodology to agree on things. Uh, we need potentially a hoc network architecture because if we need to share the same thing, we need to connect directly. Or we can have, for example, relay-based cooperation. We can have centralized decision in the sense that, okay, I give my information to a centralized guy and the centralized guy makes the decision properly. There are several, uh, you know, of these applications and it can be found in this nice paper from Achilles, who is a big guy that works with SEC, um, who was on top of, on the wave of spectrum sensing from the very, from, sorry, spectrum management from the very beginning. Uh, and the other part is the theoretical decision framework. So how I make a decision, not only how I share the information, but also how I make a decision. Because if you look, I can use data fusion in the sense that I take the raw information from different sources, I blend it all together, and then I make a decision. Or I make decision fusion, meaning that every one of you guys make a decision on your own, you give everything to me, I make another decision, the final one, based on your decisions, and I give you back to you. And I give it back to you. So <clears throat> let's look more, you know, how to make a decision. Because the technology is a technology. It depends on our application. So <clears throat> centralized decision. Every one of us makes a decision, for example, and then send it, sends it out. How do I fuse all these decisions? The simplest way are simple logic rules. Or you can, I can have something more you know, complex, like this Bayesian integrated framework. I will give you the reference later on. But again, in the, lo the, logical, the logic fusion, the simple rules are the majority. How many of you have decided that the channel is occupied? None, so the channel is free. Simple, simple case, or five tell me that it's occupied, but 10 tell, tells, tell me that it's not occupied, or it's not occupied. And then I push back the decision. You can do the same type of thing also in a distributed manner, in the sense that each one of you shares the decision, and then according to the position and so on, you take different decisions. Mm -hmm. There are frameworks for, for doing it, Application dependent, there is a friend of mine who probably investigated it, which is Maria Dolores Perez Girao from um, La, uh, Hanover University. Otherwise, Bayesian fusion, which is again similar, but given each decision, you need to compute the probability of missed alarm and the probability of false alarm of each of the decision makers given the decision they have. And then you wait, it's basically a weighted average of the, of the decisions. Couple of references, including a Da Silva, but it's not, it's not our guest, Luis, he's one of his colleagues from Virginia Tech, Claudio Da Silva. There are other ways besides the ones I showed you for making decisions.